Uh, this is Naveen Maradi. I'm from Media Cloud Engineering team. Uh, specifically, I'm from the Compute and Storage group in Media Cloud Engineering. Um, very happy to host this event, kick off. It's very exciting and to see this forming here. Uh, hoping to see more events hosted in, uh, in many other interesting uh, areas here in the Bay. So with this, I'll, I'm going to talk about today about the serverless, how we applied serverless to media processing. <coughs> Our team at Netflix is called Media Cloud Engineering. Um, we run, manage, and um, build media uh, platforms to uh, run media processing, which uh, spans from any kind of media, like uh, it could be me video, like uh, movies or TV shows, or cutting trailers, or image artwork related things. So here are some of the things that uh, we do, like uh, our team handles, uh, like we provide infrastructure for all of this media processing, like in video transcoding space uh, for movies and TV show transcoding, we provide the infrastructure, and also image processing, like a lot of the product artwork that you see on the Netflix service are all like, kind of processed on our platforms. Also, like into the Netflix studios, we support a lot of uh, content production workflows <coughs> and also content quality check workflows, like uh, verifying if subtitle is aligning correctly on the timeline or other aspects of quality of the media. All of the processing we support the platforms with. That's about our team. Um, so the agenda for my talk is uh, going to be, I'm going to give a quick short overview of the serverless so that uh, we can connect with the, con with the areas I'm going to highlight on the work we're doing here. Then I'll dive into serverless for the media processing. And then I'll invite two of our users who, out of many of our users, um, I invited two of our users to talk about their experiences using our platforms. So what is serverless? Like many of us here, it's like been buzzword for a few years. And um, I would like to highlight some, bring some excerpts and highlight some aspects of it so that um, that will help me in connecting the next uh, part of the presentation here. So what is serverless? Like um, I found this one interesting from Wikipedia, like the, the cloud <coughs> acts as a server, which means like everything else is abstracted for the user, like the auto scaling aspect of it, the resiliency aspect of running a large platform is all handled and provided as a service. Another one from Microsoft Azure's uh, documentation, I found this one where uh, serverless computing can be thought of as like a providing abstraction on top of uh, servers, infrastructures, and operating systems in your infrastructure. So, <coughs> which also connects very well with the kind of work we do at our MCE where we try to provide uh, abstractions for all common things that our users do and then uh, save the time for them so that they can focus on the business use cases. So why serverless? Some of the key benefits uh, from serverless are like managed services. There are various things that are managed to name some like servers, the whole of the compute fleet or the storage can be managed and then deployments they, you don't have to, the users don't have to manage the deployments. If just an artifact is created, once CICD blesses an artifact, then deployments are managed for them. Similarly, for the scale flexibility, like uh, most of the time, serverless goes hand in hand with <laughs> event streams connecting with an event. So events <coughs> can be bursty um, based on the time of a day or based on any event in the business use case. So the scale flexibility that you get with serverless also it relieves a lot of burden that the users have to think when you're operating a large platform. Similarly, developer productivity. Since serverless, there are nice abstractions, so it makes it easy to see that what is platform and what is user's code, and that makes it easy to run these applications locally also. Also, you get availability for free, built in, since serverless applications are generally deployed by the managed service provider in multiple zones then you get one first degree of availability story kind of for free. Now, that's about the, generally about the serverless and the key uh, things about serverless. Now, I would like, I will share about like uh, media platforms at Netflix, and then I'll see how our journey into serverless has started. 
So here is our evolution of the media platforms. First, like a, before 2011, so the first system we started was called <coughs> as Matrix, which was a very early on in the media transcoding here at Netflix, which was a from monolithic code base, like for a few, few, few members in the team, scripts were used, scripts based, and a fixed set of worker nodes, even some of it was running in data centers. Then from there, continuing on the movie thing, Matrix, we went on to reload it. So reloaded was the first thing was to have massively parallel and very highly scalable aspect as a very key thing that we were looking at Reloaded. And with that comes also the cloud adoption in Netflix. So Reloaded was massively parallel and scaled workload model. Uh, we have autoscalers which watch the backlogs and autoscale. Even Reloaded uses uh, our trough compute that is uh, unused reservations in Netflix when other parts of the business <coughs> are not using the compute. So even encoding uses that compute. So all of that was built into the smart autoscaler in Reloaded. And it was a distributed monolith where for the, we enjoyed some benefits of monolith and also then also did distributed where we have to scale. The code base was all monolith, uh, one CICD system, and deployment was all distributed. So from one repo, there were multiple applications that were deployed. Examples of applications are like video encoder, audio encoder, or subtitle processor, inspectors, but all of them <coughs> coming from one monolith code base. Then we started hearing from our users already by that time and even after then, all these requests about if I'm doing so much of video processing, why can't you just give us access to video frames? Just don't give us a video source, just give us a video frames. Which means, indirectly behind that means the video media format has to be abstracted out. The users just want like 100th frame in a movie, regardless of the source format of the, the movie. Similarly for the audio, the users want to, I started asking us, they want to have access to audio channels. Similarly to run complex encodes, um, in this time frame, we also, the encoding started getting comp complex with HDR, uh, with the Dolby, and also like other efficient encoders coming, which are more complex in compute. So running for long duration should be like a very first plus thing, and we have to support that very easily. Also, our users were asking about large media source files. We started, if you have seen a demo outside where Ken, Ken was showing an interactive title workflow. So the source <coughs> movies for these are like a five hour long videos where the deliveries from studios are long, mm -hmm. and then the users switch to the interesting parts based on the choice, which means we should support large source files out of the box easily. Also media security, like first level of security, content security should be just be addressed in the platform. So we heard all of these requests from our users and we were thinking, how do we go about this and abstract them in a nice way so that users don't have to get burdened with these things, but they get these for free. With that, we started uh, building Archer. First, in 2016, we built Archer, which was like, uh, the focus mm -hmm. was simplicity, so commonly used uh, media compute abstractions <coughs> were offered as uh, out of the box from Archer, like a map reduce abstraction, which is typically used for media encoding, where you want to, anyone who's working on media transcoding, like to split the movie, transcode, and then assemble back. So that abstraction is provided out of the box, where users just have to write split, map, collect implementations, and the workflow, the scale, the content security aspects are all handled by Archer. That was our first foray into functions where we started introducing functions with split, map, and collect functions. That is all that users have to implement. And we have a nice blog post and few talks that we have done about Archer. You can check that out. <coughs> and in 2018, uh, from Archer, we've seen a lot of benefits of serverless already by abstracting into these functions. And then our users were asking more about how do we evolve from here and <coughs> not just apply these simple abstractions for simple workflows, but also allow us to create complex workflows, but keep the simplicity of developing each function the same. With that, we started building, started with Cosmos in 2018, which has like an API and workflow, which you will see in the next talk where George will talk about the workflow aspect of it, and then the functions. Put all of this together, you can think of a video service, an audio service, or an inspection service. The compute happens in the functions, and then the workflow, and then there is an the entry gate is an API. So I'll be highlighting the serverless, the functions aspect of Cosmos. <coughs> so 
So then with, uh, with all these things, and when we're doing Cosmos, we thought like not just take serverless, we already did that in Archer. Now, how do we even enhance our user experience where we give the frames, as I mentioned before, our asks from the users, how do we surface the frames or the audio channels as first class things? So then we started thinking we should go aim, aim high like serverless plus plus. Means even make it, even abstract more things and make them part of the platform. One good example is like downloading the video frames. The downloader libraries, if you can abstract it out, then users don't have to think about the evolution of the downloader libraries. The best mechanism to download a video is managed for them. I will show how a function written in our Cosmos serverless platform looks like. I, I picked a real encode function from our Cosmos uh, production workflows. So our users start by writing, uh, by annotating their function with a media function annotation. Then this is a progress encoder here, which outputs progress encode, the given name for the function. Then given input, um, here they're requesting for a source to be mounted. So if you see the type there, which is the mounted video frame sequence. So the user just get an array of frames as an input, which is mounted for them by using a fuse file system. Like one of the demos, Mangla was showing a demo for Mowgli and a trailer creation workflows. The same source which is used in that trailer creation workflow, we use that throughout our infrastructure for remotely accessing, accessing the remote bytes. Then users can bring in some inputs like recipe, like which frames to encode, which frames to skip, other FFmpeg parameters. Similarly, more, this is a recipe here. So we give this flexibility where users can bring in their own um, processing related inputs. Here is the one which is about validation expectation. Then you can define an output reference. This is to say that there'll be one output for this function, which we mount it locally and there's a location already specified. The users just have to write their encoded video to that local location. And then our serverless platform, the function runtime will upload this bits from local to the cloud storage. And they get an execution context which gives uh, some hints about the local environment. That's all they declare and then start writing the business logic which is to encode the video. So they can pull in their FFmpeg, this is all doc, we use Docker. I'll sh highlight, show that in the next slide. So users can install their own binary dependencies and then start writing their encode recipe. <clears throat> Then save the final output to the local location. And that's it. <coughs> so once the function execution is completed, then we save the output to the cloud. With this function, I'll go deeper and show the behind the scenes of how we do this. So we have built a robust media function runtime, which is where all of our abstractions are poured into. Like we use Docker, we use Titus, which is our Netflix, even Netflix open source container management system. We, use, we run on Titus and we use Docker as the deployment unit or Docker images. So users have flexibility to bring in their own binaries or shape the Docker image with the binaries they like. And they depend on the base layer, which is the function runtime. Then with that, the, then the function runtime and the users will have a function runner where the, the user code will be running in the function runner. There'll be interaction between function runner and the function, function runtime and the runner to make the function execute. The, on the left here, the media function runtime talks to the external sources like our queuing systems to get, <coughs> one, get the workloads one at a time and then process them. So this slide shows more uh, detailed version of the interactions that happen between function runtime and the function runner. So first, the blue box here is a function runtime which we distribute, and the function runner is also what we distribute, <coughs> which also has a user's code in it, and that is our secure cloud storage. In the setup phase, um, the function runtime downloads the sources from cloud storage, sets up local directories, then the bootstrap phase, we start the green box from the previous slide, we start the function runner with the user's code. Then we execute the function. Then 
in the conclude phase, we save the outputs to the cloud. In the cleanup phase, clean up all the local assets. If you look at it, the users are just only working in the function runner. The user code is only involved there. All other aspects they get for free by running on our platform. So with this, I'd like to invite some of our users who, like uh, we have <coughs> users who are using our platforms. And first I would like to invite Shami, who will present our story and uh, how she is, how they use her for our platform for video packaging. Can't hear you. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I'm Xiao I'm Mei. I came from Netflix Encoding Technologies. Um, what do we do as an en encoding technology? So we are responsible for generating the media files for the Netflix streaming service. We're also responsible for providing um, a media processing service for the Netflix studio. Um, we build applications on top of the infrastructure that Naveen talked about, and uh, that include um, like the quality metrics, video algorithm, audio algorithm, and uh, media system or media format. So uh, I came from the, the media system group. In our group, one of the major product is called Packager. So what I'm showing here is an um, oversimplified uh, video processing pipeline. So as you can see, the um, original content is first uh, ingested into our system and get the inspection of the content. Then the video content is uh, breaking up to smaller pieces, like video chunks, to take advantage of a cloud encoding uh, processing. Once all these video chunks finish processing, finish encoding, then we uh, reassemble them to become the encoded video asset. Um, and after we generate the encoded video, then they will go to a stage of packager um, to generate the packaged stream. The, the packaged asset is the one that is ready to be distributed through CDN to reach our uh, client, streaming client. And so the packager is the highlighted component that does the transformation of encoded video to format suitable for streaming. It's also adding the DRM protection. A packager in the old reloaded world is just a joblet. When I mean joblet, it is really a media processing worker. Um, now as a packager, as an early adopter of uh, this new serverless platform, uh, the previous packager joblet is uh, transformed into a full microservice. When I mean full microservice, it includes API, it includes a uh, rule engine, and also includes uh, different serverless functions. Um, so as a de de developer of this um, new packager service and, and, uh, and a use user of this new platform, so I want to share some of the experience I have with this new platform. I see several advantage of this new platform com compared with the previous um, um, previous the joblet world. The first is the each of the right now the function the media processing the serverless function is faster to deploy. Right now it takes like uh, uh, several minutes to deploy it to the cloud. Uh, compared with previously, each each of the joblet takes at least like twenty minutes or even longer to deploy. This gave us the capability to do a faster iteration in the development. Um, another area of improvement <coughs> is this um, serverless function is easier to set up and maintain. Uh, in the old jobless world, uh, in the old joblet world, in order to set up a new joblet, there are a lot of manual configuration, manual registration. Across multiple repos, you have to configure the things correctly. The naming has to match. And just to get a hello world out of Joblet is not a trivial effort. Uh, in addition, on top of that, we have a very complicated release chain and have uh, multiple um, branches like the dev branch, test branch, and the prod branch. A lot of the com configuration needs to be separately configured for all these different branch and different environment in the cloud. So all this make it uh, make the Joblet is a uh, higher uh, cost for maintenance, a lot of overhead. 
And because of that, what do we do as a developer? We just don't create that many droplets. We uh, consolidate a lot of the functions into a single droplet. Uh, for example, I use Packager as an example. The Packager, uh, the, we support about a dozen different uh, formats for the packaging. Uh, just due to this overhead of the droplet, we just condense it to a single droplet. All of them just processed in a single droplet. There is a, a long list of the switch, switch statement, which is not very good uh, design by itself. When we move to this new uh, serverless platform, um, one improvement is the startup is uh, very quickly. It's a, we have this code generator that generate the hello world out of the box. You can quickly get startup of a function. And adding a function uh, is also easy. And also, we simplified the uh, like this re re release train, not having that many uh, branches. Uh, with that, the cost of maintenance is lowered. We can now having a lot more uh, serverless functions for the packager. So in theory, I could have like uh, each different format. I could have a separate uh, function to to do the packaging. Uh, this helps improve a lot of the scalability thing. Think about for different packaging format, like the ProRes, it takes a lot of huge amount of space. It takes like easily takes uh, several hundred uh, GB. But for other packaging format, like um, fragmented MP4, it's probably just a, a couple of GB or even less, right? So when we separated these two different functions, the scaling becomes much better. And, um, and the other benefit is, as Naveen pointed out, now the platform is taking over a lot of the common functionality from the application. For example, it provides the media abstraction to the application. Uh, it, we ac access the, um, the media as a file, as a sequence of chunks, or as a sequence of frames, which make it much easier to develop the uh, application itself. Uh, in, a, in addition, the platform <coughs> take care of setting up the input and saving the output. And there are a lot of behind scene optimization, like the mounting the cloud uh, storage to a local disk, um, the do some of the caching, do the look ahead, and all these optimization is behind the scene. Um, the application developer, we just uh, treat, treat the application just as local file as input and local file as output. This also significantly helped. Um, and finally, we, um, we are uh, thinking about using something called the media document, which is a distributed uh, uh, cloud database to save a lot of the rich technical um, uh, metadata for the me media. And what cloud uh, and the platform did is just mount that the cloud database to a local file for the application <coughs> to use. So these are all the ben benefits uh, I have experienced. But I do want to mention beyond the benefit, there are also a lot of challenges. Um, we, we all know like microservices has been used uh, in Netflix <coughs> for, uh, for a long time. However, this is the first time we've been using microservice in the media processing pipeline. So uh, a lot of things are really new to all of us. Um, for one of the ch challenge, for example, we have um, busy production system that uh, supporting the Netflix streaming service and the studio. And we need to provide a smooth transition from the old uh, monolithic system to the old this microservice world um, smoothly without the pro production disruption, which is a huge challenge. Um, another area that we have a, a challenge is the continuous integration, continuous deployment um, for the microservice world. Uh, I think in the typical microservice world, we can assume that each microservice is independent. And the contract uniquely defined the mi microservice. However, when you think about in the media processing, the media file is uh, distributed across the different microservices. Is this still true that each microservice is independent? What is considered as a contract? Can we release each individual microservice without cross-service testing. Um, all these uh, challenges, things we are still exploring. And this is the area we would <coughs> love to hear stories from our peers in the uh, uh, media processing industry. We want to hear your story and uh, um, learn from you.
Hi, so I'm the second use case for uh, the functions for media, and my team is media intelligence team, and what our goal fundamentally is to present the right set of evidence for movies so that users watch it. Primarily, we interact with uh, artwork and video, and that's what I was going to talk about today. So as you might know that uh, Netflix is uh, does personalization of artwork. We have a nice tech blog about how we personalize our artwork with a machine learning model. And not only that, we have large amount of canvases on different form factors like mobile and tablets and everywhere else. So combination of these two together, we have an explosion of images that we serve to our users. Uh, at any point, uh, so there, could, there could be more than 1,000 images for every movie that we produce might be available for us. So we were thinking about being creative and solving that problem. And one of the solutions that we came up with that uh, pretty obvious is what if we took really great frames from video and used those as a raw images to create great artwork. Uh, and the challenge, as you might have guessed, is that because the video has such a large amount of frames, like for a typical one hour video would have hundred thousands of frames. Uh, to distill those frames to like few great imagery that can be used subsequent to create the artwork that would be relevant to you as a user and you would like to watch that content. And the way we did it is based on the infrastructure, the functions that are provided to us and using machine learning and computer vision. I'm going to talk about some of the underlying technology that makes it happen. So we have a tech blog about this and we have more details in, in the blog. But essentially, what we are doing is we are processing each and every frame of a video uh, uh, to, to gather some metadata and uh, information about those frames. Things like, the, obviously, the faces and salience in there and the optical flow of those frames, as well as uh, the facial landmarks, so we can understand overall expression of character. Uh, and using all of this metadata and few other set of information that we are retrieving from every single frame, we can surface some great looking frames of that video. In other words, out of those 100,000 or so frames that are available for a video, distill it down to 100 that are really, really good quality images that can be used for a lot of uh, artwork creation. Uh, we have some examples of great cinematic uh, images that were generated through the use uh, surface through the algorithm, and not only that, on the right-hand side, we have an example of a character uh, and uh, the most important times when that character appears on that video. Uh, and so all of this, the, there are some interesting challenges there. One of the challenges that uh, Netflix has a probably really huge catalog of videos, and we want to process in a very deterministic fashion. Uh, we are continuously adding more algorithm and more processing time. So, and despite of that fact, we want to process every frame with a deterministic time. And one way we were able to accomplish that is through the Archer framework, which is the, the framework that used to do map and reduce to, to, to process that video. And in this particular instance, the way we did it, we took a, let's say, one hour video, and we have a prior understanding of where the short boundaries of each, uh, each of the video's content is. So based on that short boundary, we wrote a map function that splits that video into separate chunks, and each chunk can get processed independently. And with those, with each chunks being uh, mapped on a disk, local disk, that can be uh, processed and evaluated for the model. And then we use the, this information and stored in the media database that we, are, we have previously uh, described. And in the collect function, what we can do is we can uh, get the global understanding of that particular content, as in how many times a particular character is appearing, or is it a cake baking show, and therefore a cake is important for that show, or is it like a stand-up comedy, or is this a documentary about Bill Gates? 
So all of that information we can sort of gather around and combine in the collect, collect function. Uh, and with that, we were, we were able to like distill down uh, both clips and, uh, and, and frames that are important for that title instead of, any, instead of some human manually going through all of those frames at once. Uh, I think this, this is fundamental.